So, I should start with telling you why I started my research path. Because my research path, as was already mentioned now, started actually with disappointment and frustration. Disappointment and frustration because I was successful in what I was doing at that time. That was my PhD. I got as a task to find a pharmaceutical compound which would lower cholesterol and the intention of a Slovenian pharmaceutical company was to do this compound. Well, I looked, when it comes to that, into the world of fungi. And let me introduce fungi, because I'm sure many of you do not know what fungi are. It's everything from yeast to mushrooms to uh, molds, also what you find in the walls, sometimes in your bedroom. So all this is a world of fungi. Like I said, in this quest to find a compound, I found a solution and it was in this particular uh, mushroom that you all know. No, it's called oyster mushroom and they sell it also on our markets. The problem was that it took me a little while to find out that the pharmaceutical company that wanted me to find that, in reality, never wanted to do anything with it. They just wanted to have an international cover patent, a smoke screen. In reality, they wanted to follow technology of a big multinational company. I was idealistic. I was sad. I was disappointed, as I said. But after, in the end of the day, when I realized all that, I, le well, I was left with two things. My everlasting love to fungi, which is go went through with, with me throughout my entire scientific career, and a really, really strong need to start something totally, completely new, preferentially something out in nature. At that time, in microbiology, extreme environments and extremophiles became a fashion. Also, microbiology has fashions. People were at that time looking in these exotic places, hot springs, hot places, salty places, and discovering totally new forms of life. But they were all bacteria, prokaryotes. I was not interested in that. So I decided, why wouldn't I start working with fungi in an extreme environment? And which one to select? The world, like I said, is full of them. But what do we have in Slovenia? We have beautiful sorterets, probably 2,000 years old, surely at least 700. And in these sorterets of Sechaulie, we have microbial mats, which have been cultivated for the last 700 years continuously. Quite a unique place. Additionally, we have a natural laboratory, because seawater comes with the salinity of seawater, of course, which is 3%, and then it evaporates, and in the end, you have 32% saturation. So we have the entire range of salinities. Like I said, a wonderful natural laboratory. What was known at that time when I started? It's like 20 years ago now. What was known about fungi in hypersaline environment? What every housewife knows, that they're really very good at when it comes to contaminating food which is preserved with high concentrations of salt or food preserved with high concentrations of sugar. If anything grows there, it is a fungus. So we can call them domesticated extremophiles. But when it comes to what they're doing in nature in such places, every textbook repeated, they are not there. They do not exist. And before I continue with what we found, let me explain what is the problem when you live in high salt, when you live in hypersalinity. If you're not adapted, if the cell is not adapted, in hypersalinity, water goes out of the cell and the cytoplasm shrinks. So that's the first problem. The second one is that ions, which are in the water, so sodium and, and chlorine ions, invade the cell and they're toxic. So cells have to be adapted on these two levels. And when your organisms live in this hypersaline environment, we say that they live in an environment which has low biological availability of water. Although water is there, it is bound, chemically bound. So it's a desert, in fact. Well, what did we find in our salterans? Surprisingly big populations of fungi. It was a total surprise. And it took us 
quite many years, I can say, before we were able to convince the scientific community that what we are getting are not contaminants. We had to go to conferences and keep repeating that. But really, they were not contaminants. And we could really, for the first time in public, in a really strong way, say that when we organized the first halophilic conference in Ljubljana in 2004, and here you can see the members, the inhabitants of the Salterans. They're a very special, mysterious group of fungi. They're called black yeast, because they have melanin, as we have in our skin, they have it in the cell walls. So therefore, they're black. They, slow, they grow very, very slowly, and they have a special form of uh, reproduction, and I will spare you the details. Well, what we first found in the Salterans, we considered might it be that this is just a local phenomenon? After all, our Salterans are so special. Is it also anywhere else? So we went first to Spain and later on to many places around the world, and we now can say that they are inhabiting Salterans all around the world. So it is indeed a global phenomenon. So suddenly I found myself that I am actually living what I wanted. I'm having, let's say, a job on the edge. I'm traveling a lot. It's definitely an adventure. We are discovering totally new places. And our main model organism that you can see here, this black yeast called Everneki, became uh, an object that we described and we um, investigated in depth when it comes to molecular mechanisms. But we also looked into its ecology. When we first time found it in the Salterans, they were known, these black yeasts, as contaminant of salty food, fish and ham. And they were also known for the fact that they can cause coloration of the palms of the hands, as you can see on the picture, which is called tinea nigra. Mainly a cosmetic problem, I should say. But nobody really knew how they came to these palms. We found them en masse in salt and all around the world. We found them bound to salt crystals. We know they can degrade wood under hypersaline conditions. And the last discovery when it comes to ecology was a totally surprising one. We found them in the driest place on Earth, in the Atacama Desert in Chile, only on spider webs. Well, this micro safari that we went through over the years discovered real beauties, like this one. It's called Emericilla stellamaris, the sea star. And in this way, we discovered, we discovered and described around 20, 25 new species, new species for science. But we didn't only intend to solve biodiversity problems. The aim all the time was to tackle one of the global problems we have today. Salinization of land. Due to global warming, more and more land is being irrigated and consequentially saline. And we create saline deserts where no normal crops can grow. So they are lost for us, lost for humanity, unless we manage to produce transgenic plants. And this is what we did only this year. We identified many potential target genes from halophilic organisms. And we selected one which we introduced into this plant, first step on a very long path, I should say. But if you look at the picture on the right, you will see a plant that has longer and more extensive roots due to this transformation. And it can reach deeper into the soil and avoid the salinity on the surface. Well, I hope that by now I have convinced you that water indeed changes everything. And with this idea that it does, we went to another environment. That environment is ice, glaciers. Because you see, our thinking was that if you expose the cells to low temperatures, to ice, very similar things happen like in hypersaline environment. Water is bound in ice, therefore not available to microorganisms. Additionally, ions, which remain outside the ice, do invade the cells. So we thought we might try with this idea to get some European funding and go to the north. We succeeded and we went to Svalbard, quite close to the North Pole, as you can see, to Kongsfjorden, as that you see also there, 
which is a fjord which is covered, I mean, it's, it's totally closed by different glaciers. And with this idea, we look to find in the glaciers, in particular, an, an environment where they have never been found. That is the subglacial environment. This is the environment on the bottom of the glacier in contact, contact with, the, with the ground where a thin film of water forms because the mass of, of ice pushes down. So we hoped, we thought, there might be really microbial life, fungal life. And indeed, we found big population of red and white yeast. And we are talking huge numbers here. If you look, one plate, two milliliters of molten ice. If you look at the second one, 0.1 milliliter of molten ice. We are really talking of huge numbers. But if you take a ice, a piece of ice that you see here, which has gypsum inclusions, gypsum being one of the minerals that precipitates in the solterans as well, you come back to our friend's black yeast. And in fact, this beauty is very closely to related to one of the main black yeasts we find in the solterans. Of course, you can ask me, again, where is the applied aspect? Why do it? Because we know acid is appearing in polar areas, and these organisms are being released in the ground being released in the oceans, and they add nitrogen, they add also diversity that nobody suspected before. But if you want me to be even more applied, well, we all know that when you wash silk, you have to use slow temperatures. Normal enzymes don't do it well. But if you take the enzymes of a psychrophilic organism, which means cold adapted organisms, it does the job beautifully. And now I come to something else, to what was mentioned in the beginning by Matei. He said that my story is connected on one side with frustration and a little bit also, he didn't use, I'm not sure really if he used this word, boredom. And this boredom comes to a day when I was sick at home. And I walked around and stepped in front of my dishwasher. And I said, is this an environment where microorganisms, where fungi could grow. Why not? Come on, it has high temperatures, it has high salinity, all the salt we put in, it has very, very varied pH, so from 7, like water, until 12. So it's a poorly extremo tolerant environment. And you know, being who I am, I took a sample, and this is not my dishwasher, but I saw many of those, and actually, to my big surprise, I found that my dishwasher is full of this pathogenic black yeast. It's really a nasty stuff. This yeast, before I found it in my dishwasher, was known only from patients. It's connected with cystic fibrosis, it can uh, infect intestinal tract, it can be spread via nervous system and make tumors in your brain. You can have subcutaneous infections really bad. Nobody really, yeah, well, it's not the end of the story. Nobody, <laughs> nobody really knew where in nature it was. But this discovery that it was in my dishwasher, and I, I, I do admit I'm not a perfect housewife, but still, I thought, okay, let's test the dishwashers of the people from my group. So all of them had to bring them, and they were all positive. Then we asked students, and students brought samples from all around Slovenia. Two-thirds were positive. Then we asked colleagues around the world. To make it short, more than 60% were positive. Of course it made us think. We thought, today everybody is so ecological, which is great. But with these conditions, we create the perfect stage for this type of organisms because we kill the competition and we enrich those that can just make it, like this one. Because it's a human pathogen, like I said, it needs to grow 37 and more when it comes to temperature. So each time you press the button, you actually start, you trigger an evolutionary cycle. So off goes the competition, on goes the selected pathogen. So this is, for example, the direct sample from my dishwasher. If you put the tape on the rubber around the door, you look it under the microscope, this is what you see. We wrote this article. Yeah, and it turned out that this article, when they made at the, at the uh, when the, this journal were published, they made a press release, 
went, as they say today, totally viral. It attracted incredible attention, and media from all around the world started to report on that, and we got the estimate that around 800 million people heard about this. So, of course, with titles that Natasha could comment on, your dishwasher is trying to kill you. I mean, <laughs> it's not exactly nice to be the author of something like that. I mean, even if it's not directly, but it happened. But let me tell you, I still use my dishwasher. And I do believe if you are healthy, if your immune system is fine, you'll be fine. But if you have somebody ill at home or a baby, I wouldn't wash things in dishwashers. And I do believe it is an emerging problem that in some years we will face more and more. But let me finish this research path of mine by saying that this disappointment that started it all up was with a grain of salt and some black yeast, as you can say. And it one required to look a little bit out of the box or like this cat out of the cage. Then we could make the step, step from the Salterans, at first sight, very different from the glaciers, but really connected to the dishwashers. And I hope this is not kind of symbolism here. And I don't want to end up with dishwashers, so I'll end up with this crystal of salt, something you know as plain and white, but if you look at it in a different angle, it shows secrets and it shows colors that require some time, but then you can see them. Thank you.